Hello, I'm Dr. George Backris, Professor of Medicine and Director of the American Heart Association Comprehensive Hypertension Center at the University of Chicago Medicine. And today, <clears throat> I'm going to be speaking to you about finerenone and its use in patients with diabetes and kidney disease associated disorders from diabetes. This is a very important area as this is the number one cause of kidney failure in the world. And we have new therapies now and I want to go through as to what the benefits are, what the details are in terms of the data and how to use them in the so-called pillars of therapy that you're familiar with in heart failure. Well, we now have enough information in kidney disease that we can talk about pillars of therapy. So this is what I'm going to be talking to you about today. This is uh, my dualities of interest. So first of all, let me start off by giving you a concept that is very important and took me decades to get cardiologists to understand, and that is that presence of kidney disease is a cardiovascular risk factor. And what am I talking about? You can see from this epidemiologic data in over a million people from the Kaiser Permanente system that if you have kidney disease with a GFR of less than 45, you have a f over fourfold higher risk of all cause mortality and an 11 fold plus risk of cardiovascular events. And of course, it goes up dramatically as kidney function further declines. So, this is very, very important to understand. And it's a risk factor because if you transplant these people, guess what? The cardiovascular risk falls dramatically to age match controls. So this is very important. Now, of the different maladies that you could have in heart disease in people with kidney disease, by far, heart failure is the most common cause. And you can see in these Venn diagrams, it's three times more likely in people with kidney disease compared to people without kidney disease. So something for you to know, something for you to translate to the patient. Speaking of translating to the patient, let me show you the famous KDGO heat map. This is called a heat map because it's got different colors. And there are two components to this. You need both these components to make a diagnosis of kidney disease. The GFR alone is only half the story. You need both. So, what do you have? You have different colors. Obviously, I don't think I have to explain to you if you're in red or orange, you're in trouble. If you're in green, you're in good shape. So, the patient needs to know what color box they're in. And they will figure out that they're in trouble or not. Why is this important? Most patients have kidney disease and don't know it because it's asymptomatic. It is a silent killer, like blood pressure. Number two, if they know the stage of kidney disease they're in, especially if they know they can halt progression dramatically without stopping it, they are more likely to listen to you for instructions. And so adherence definitely will go up, and I have evidence of this in my practice. So this is very, very important to transmit, and it's also very important and for guidelines to measure a spot albumin creatinine in all these patients so that you know where they are. And obviously, the higher the value, the more in trouble they are. If you need help from nephrologists, please ask them. They'll be more than happy to help you and guide your therapy. But even if at low levels, like microalbuminuria, that is a cardiovascular risk marker. And I'm going to show you some data about that in a second. That should not be taken lightly. It should be intervened with as well. This is early data that we published in 2014 showing that if you have microalbuminuria, that is an indicator of inflammation, not just kidney disease. Inflammation, it's the kidney telling you you have inflammation. And you can see all the different diseases that can cause microalbuminuria. So the reason to measure it is not because you have kidney disease or not. It's to see if you have an inflammatory component, the kidney is telling you it's, so the kidney's seeing that, and you need to do something about it. Well, what are you going to do? Well, you're going to control blood pressure, you're going to control lipids, and you're going to control the um, glucose. 
And of course, blockers of the renin angiotensin system are the cornerstone of this therapy. We'll get to that in a minute. But that's it. That's the magic recipe. There's nothing more than that. Managing the underlying disease, if there is one, is another one. But those are the things that you have to keep in mind. Now, this is recent data, just published in JAK, basically telling you albuminuria is a risk factor for heart failure. And this is a very nicely done study. I was privileged enough to be part of this group, but it's mostly cardiologists that have actually put this together and made a very strong argument. And there, it's all very evidence-based. It's all trial-related. So you're measuring the urine for the heart, not just the kidney. So very important point. Please get a spot albumin creatinine. It's very simple to do. Make sure that you do it. Now, where are we going with all this? Well, if you look at dialysis rates in the world, this is in the world and different regions of the world, you can see that it's going up. And it's going to be more than doubled by 2030 at the rate it's going compared to 2010. Not a good thing. What can we do? Do we have anything special beyond what I just said to slow it down? Well, we have two famous trials with angiotensin receptor blockers, the Renal and id &T, and that definitely slows kidney disease progression. Unfortunately, you can see the amount of residual risk. So, that's a good start, but that's definitely not a finish. And notice the doses. I'm just showing you the doses for a very important reason. The point is, if you use these agents correctly, you have your first pillar of therapy. That is RAS blockade. Now, where do we go from there? And what does that mean in, in the scope of the heat map? Well, if we go back to the heat map, you can see that we're covering a very small box, or boxes. And we really need to do a lot better. The other problem is that physicians are not really taught to use these correctly. That is the RAS blockers. So potassium goes up a little bit. Creatinine goes up a little bit. They get scared. They either stop the drug or they reduce the dose. So one has to ask the question, does down titrating, who's doing whom a favor? I mean, that's really the question. Do you really think you're doing anything? You think you're saving them? You're helping the patient? Uh, no. Here's data <clears throat> that was published a few years ago in over 90,000 people. And it looks at different outcomes from different diseases. And you can see here that the people that had their dose reduced to 50% less or some submaxal dose didn't do any better than if the drug was stopped. So they're either taking the drug or they're not taking the drug. It's as simple as that. And I can give you the reasons for that pharmacologically, but we don't have time. It does have to do with receptor binding and obviously less drug, less receptor binding, and more RAS activity. Now you could say, well, this is one study. And it's dangerous to use these drugs in people with very advanced kidney disease. Okay, let's take a look. This is an epidemiologic study, retrospective, 3,900 plus people from the Geisinger Health System in Pennsylvania. And here they took everybody, everybody with a GFR of less than 30, less than 30. So that means they had stage 4 CKD. Now you can imagine they're going to have potassium problems. You can imagine their creatinine is going to go up if you give them a RAS blocker. Nevertheless, they asked the question, does it matter? or not, if we give RAS blockers. So this is what you're looking at here for all-cause mortality. For all-cause mortality, guess what? If you stayed on an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, you did better than if you came off of it. All-cause mortality. Well, you're worried about dialysis. Okay, here's the data for dialysis. You stayed on it, you were less likely to go. Yes, the creatinine went up. I don't have time to educate you about that. It's okay for the creatinine to go up even 25, 30%, as long as it's stable. And we have ways to, to manage potassium now. So you don't need to stop it. 
but nevertheless, another positive outcome. Now, when we originally published this concept of it's okay for the creatinine to go up when you're treating these people because there's a benefit, that was in 2000. And a number of people challenged me on this, and none of them could disprove it. So finally, the Brits got together, and we're going to definitively show that I was crazy. So they did the Stop A study. And the Stop A study clearly did not show anywhere near the fact that I was crazy. In fact, it showed no difference between the groups. And if anything here, you can look at dialysis outcomes. They look slightly better. So it was okay. And these are people with GFRs down to 15, by the way. So it's kind of okay to keep these people on ACE inhibitors. It's kind of okay for creatinines to go up 10, 20%. Not a big deal. As long as you follow them and manage them, they will do fine. All right. That's what we had up until 2001. Now, there were a lot of different studies that were done. Different compounds, different mechanisms, all failed. And then, around 2013, 2014, we had the emergence of the SGLT2 inhibitors. Now, I don't have time to get into all of this. And then, literally, on the heels of, not even on the heels, halfway through the SGLT2 trials, finerenone was started into studies, and that followed very quickly on the heels of SGLT2s. So you could say the decade of 2010 to 2019 was a banner year for diabetic kidney disease because we had both these compounds being studied with positive results coming out in that decade. Now, what are the data with the SGLT2s very quickly? Very quickly, because this is a summary, a meta-analysis of all the data in all the trials, both kidney and um, other studies, basically showing very positive results, and this is why they're mandated in the guidelines. So, I think we all know that SGLT2s are really, if you carefully read the ADA guidelines, if you have kidney disease, they're preferred to metformin for management of uh, reducing kidney disease progression and reducing heart failure. So, one of the reasons why a lot of people didn't use them is because they thought they were glucose-lowering agents and this kidney function declines, you're not going to get very much glucose reduction, and everybody was ignoring the protective benefits. So I was asked to write an editorial perspective for the American Journal of Kidney Diseases because even nephrologists were not using them. So the conclusion of that perspective was that SGLT2 inhibitors should be thought of as cardiorenal risk-reducing drugs. And it's, those effects are irrespective of glucose. has nothing to do, the benefits have nothing to do with glucose lowering. They are totally different mechanisms. So it's very important for you to understand that, and they should be used. And just shy of putting them in the drinking water, not quite that far, but just shy of that. And in fact, when you look at the 2023 ADA guidelines, SGLT2s are preferred if you have kidney disease or heart failure over metformin. Doesn't mean you can't use metformin. Of course you can use metformin, but they are preferred. And by the way, GLP-1 RAs are preferred if you have atherosclerotic heart disease based on data. So where are we now? Where are we? This was originally came out in 2021. We have the second pillar of therapy, the SGLT2 inhibitors, along with RAS blockade, because all these studies were done on background RAS blockade. Well, we still need more. We weren't done. The risk was reduced, but you can see we still have a lot of residual risk. And the SGLT2s really do nothing to blood pressure. And so this was really perceived to be a metabolic anti-inflammatory effect, but we still had a lot of inflammation that we really needed to deal with. Enter the mineralocorticoid receptor blockers. 
And these agents, aldosterone specifically, is known to be elevated in people with diabetes, the visceral adipocytes, and even the peripheral adipocytes, but the visceral adipocytes for sure, produce aldosterone and release it. So the more obese you are, the more likely you are to have some increase in aldosterone that is floating around. And aldosterone has a narrow therapeutic window. It's a great hormone, does really well, but you get too much of it, it is too much of a good thing because it increases fibrosis, both in the heart and the kidney and the blood vessels. So very important point to keep in mind in people that have diabetes, type 2 diabetes specifically, that really have issues. So what happened in 2012? Well, in 2012, a whole new family of drugs was developed called non-steroidal MRAs. And you can see spironolactone and aplerinone above and below are the non-steroidal MRAs. And the non-steroidal MRAs have, as you can see, no steroid structure. They're very different and even different amongst themselves. Finerinone was the one originally developed by Bayer in Germany. And a chemist, pharmacologist by the name of Peter Kolkov really spent 10 years of his life developing this. And this was the drug that was going to be used. Now, how are these drugs different? Well, different in many, many ways. And one of the ways that you can see here in this picture that we put together for this publication was that the chemistry of them is very different. The bulkiness is different. And bulkiness meaning the way they plug in to the receptor. In one case, it's flat and just goes in like you would an outlet. The other one has got more of a configuration to it. It's not flat. And why is that important? Well, because it stimulates different genes. And those genes are what is causing the different issues that you may see. And again, the benefit is you're blocking aldosterone. So that's happening. But it's the other related issues. And you'll see that in a minute. For example, if you look at the potency of finerenone and compare it to spironolactone, they're similar, far better than aplerinone. If you look at the selectivity, it is the most selective amongst the three. There is no penetration into the brain. There's no sexual side effects. And the half-life is two to three hours. Now, you're going to say, wait a minute. If it's only two to three hours, how does it work all day? Because it has nothing to do with how long the drug lasts. It's how it has interfaced with the receptor. And that enduring effect is why you're seeing the differences. And it has no active metabolites. And here it's misleading because it says there's no effect on blood pressure or minimal. Turns out if your blood pressure is elevated, 150, 160, there's very good blood pressure lowering effects, and there are publications on this. But in the trials, people came in with very good blood pressure control, so the effect is minimal, similar to SGLT2s. So let's take a look at the trials. I was privileged enough to be the principal investigator of this program, and I got together my some really good friends that are very good in different areas, not just nephrology, but endocrinology, cardiology, and we put together a program. And the program was we would, the notion was we would use the same protocol. We would change the inclusion criteria. And the reason to do that is when we finish with these big trials, we'd be able to take all the patients from both the trials, put them together in one database, and call it the Fidelity Program, which is what we did. So, Fidelio was a diabetic kidney disease study focused on kidney outcomes with cardiovascular outcomes secondary. Figaro was a healthier kidney population focused on cardiovascular outcomes, but secondary endpoints were on, on the kidney. And Fidelity focused on both kidney and cardiovascular outcomes. So, let me show you the program. So if you look at the top of the screen, you'll see the protocol that we used in both trials 
everybody, everybody had to be on maximally tolerated doses of an ACE or an ARB. No other trial that I've ever been involved with has done this. If you could not be on a maximally tolerated ACE or ARB, you couldn't get in the study. So no, nobody was coming in with five of lisinopril or two and a half of enalapril. You had to be on real doses. And then you got randomized to placebo or finerenone, 10 milligrams if your GFR was less than 60. Or if it was 60 or higher, you got 20 milligrams, which was the dose that 73% of the people, regardless of how you started, ended up with. And you can see the number of people in each study. Together, it's over 13,000. And the primary endpoint in Figaro was a cardiovascular endpoint, which was basically MACE, including hospitalization for heart failure, and the kidney endpoint, which was the same endpoint as the primary endpoint in the Fidelio study, which was a greater than 40% reduction in GFR, dialysis, or death. And the cardiovascular endpoint was the same as the primary endpoint. And then we did the fidelity pooled analysis. The difference between this analysis and the other two studies is we had many more patients. And we also used a more strict renal endpoint. We used doubling of serum creatinine, which is 57% reduction, along with dialysis and the other events. Otherwise, they were the same. This was an international trial. We looked at all different countries around the globe. And the results are gratifying. Here are the renal results. Doubling of creatinine, ESRD or death. And you can see we got a 23% risk reduction. 23% risk reduction. Now, we looked at the components that went into this outcome. And a very pleasant surprise, standalone, we got a 20% reduction in people going on to dialysis. Yes, all the other secondary endpoints were positive, but the primary component, dialysis, there was a 20% reduction. We like that. Now, do you need to have a certain amount of kidney function for this to work? Answer, no. We looked at this subsequently, and you can see that it didn't matter what GFR range you were in, there was a benefit. It didn't matter how much albuminuria you had, just like the SGLT2s. It didn't matter. There was a benefit. Now, what about cardiovascular? Well... Here's a cardiovascular endpoint, the MACE plus hospitalization for heart failure. And there was a 14% risk reduction. And you can see these benefits start even at six months. Okay, what about the components here? Well, heart failure hospitalization clearly led the charge. There was no question about it. But cardiovascular death just missed being significant in the trial. Now, there was a separate analysis that was done of all the heart failure patients and heart failure outcomes. And that is shown here, recently published. And you can see here whether you were talking about time to first hospitalization for heart failure, composite time to CV death or first hospitalization for heart failure, time to recurrent heart failure, or finally, composite of CV death or recurrent heart failure across the board, if you were in the finerenone group, you had far fewer events. Very important. Additionally, we did an intention to treat, which is the proper statistical way, but then we also did, which is just as important, an on-treatment analysis of the people that were actually on the drug and stayed on the drug the whole time. Very important data. You'll see here the on-treatment analysis on the bottom, and both all-cause mortality and CV mortality were significantly improved. If you look at the primary analysis above, you can see, as I mentioned, CV mortality didn't quite make it, all-cause mortality didn't quite make it, but if you stayed on treatment, you got there. 
So important cardiovascular outcomes here. Now, another practical, very important cardiovascular outcome, new onset atrial fibrillation. This was looked at in people with and without a history of atrial fibrillation. And this is time of onset. So what you're looking at here are the people that did not have a history, did not have a history of atrial fibrillation. And you can see that finerenone reduced the risk of developing atrial fibrillation. So it's unclear what the mechanism is of this. It's unclear what other aspects are uh, showing up here, but it's in, important to keep in mind that there are other benefits here other than just reducing heart failure risk. Now, let's take a look at something very important here. If you go on finerenone with a blocker of the renin angiotensin system, you reduce heart failure hospitalization by 22%. You reduce dialysis risk by 20%. Not bad. Now, everybody wants to know why haven't you mentioned hyperkalemia? Because immediately everybody thinks this is the son of spironolactone. Well, I already showed you. There may be, maybe third or fourth cousins, but they're certainly not in the same family. They are very different. So, what was the hyperkalemia rate? What happened? Well, it turns out, when you look at it, 110 people out of 6,500 had to discontinue the study because of hyperkalemia, whereas only 38 in the placebo group did. Let's be a little more careful. Is the hyperkalemia rate the same as spironolactone, or is it different? Well, there's no head-to-head -head comparison. However, what we did is we went into the Fidelity database and found people with true resistant hypertension, true resistant hypertension, and compared them to people in the AMBER trial. The AMBER trial was a trial of true resistant hypertension. All, every, both studies, everybody had kidney disease, and you can see the GFRs here in the mid-30s. And... In the AMBER trial, we were testing to see whether potassium binder, pteromere, allowed you to take spironolactone, which is the guideline recommended fourth drug for resistant hypertension. So, if you then look at hyperkalemia rates in these people that were about as much well matched as you can make, get them, the hyperkalemia rate in the finerenone group without any binders, without any binders, was 11.6%. In the spironolactone group, with binders, it was three times that. More than three times that. So clearly, they do not have the same risk of hyperkalemia. And that's why in all these trials that I'm sharing with you now, we didn't check the potassium for one month after we started it. So just FYI, we're not worried about the risk because we already saw it. So let's move ahead. What about combining them? If SGLT2s are really good, if is really good, the two of them together must be amazing. Well, let's take a look at the data. When you look at the data in preclinical models, so this is a animal study, looking at whether the combination is better or worse, and it's not in diabetes, it's in hypertension. But if you look at cardiac fibrosis, or you look at survival, the combination of, in this case, embigaflozin with finerenone, both at low doses, gave you the least amount of fibrosis and the best survival, compared to any of them alone. Very important observation. Well, did we look at it in the trial? Of course we did. But not many people were on SGLT2s at the time we did it. But we, what we did find is, if you were on an SGLT2, with finerenone, you had an even lower risk of hospitalization from heart failure. So the combination really is very beneficial. 
at kidney, the kidney data was not as dramatic as this. And in fact, it didn't really show anything additive. But here for heart failure hospitalization, clearly showed a benefit. The other thing is, if you look at the solid lines here, the solid lines in blue were the people on finerenone with an SGLT2. And you can see albuminuria was the lowest of any of them. So you're getting a benefit there. And the other thing is that if you were on an SGLT2 in the finerenone group, you had the least amount of hyperkalemia, less than even the diuretic or trending in that direction. So where does that bring us now? Well, we've expanded the boxes dramatically. And our level of knowledge now with finerenone and the SGLT2s really has dramatically magnified the number of people we know if we treat can be well covered and we can slow progression. In fact, recently there was a joint ADA KDGO guideline, so the nephrologist and endocrinologist getting together in terms of how to approach people with diabetes and kidney disease. And you can see here, if you're in green, you must be as part of the treatment at some point. And again, we're back to SGLT2s. If you have any albuminuria at all after being on a RAS blocker with an SGLT2, greater than 30, you have to be on finerenone. So everybody's on the same page here. Now, finishing up, where are we? Here's kind of the evolution in history. If you go back to 1980, where we had no therapy whatsoever, basically, bottom line, you were losing 10 to 12 mLs per minute per year. What does that mean? Well, if you got diagnosed with diabetes, that means best case scenario, 15 to 18 years, worst case scenario, 8 to 10 years, you're going to be on dialysis. Today, you can see that we have dramatically improved this and so now, if you do everything right, you're down to about 2.5 mLs per minute per year loss, which means you've got a tremendous amount of time compared to where you were before. Is it normal? No. Normal is about 0 0.8. So we're about 2.5. So we can get closer. So I want to finish this kind of brief update in history with the pillars of therapy. And the question is, where are we now? Well, we've got RAS blockers, got SGLT2s, and we have finerenone, all of which need to be used to maximally reduce the risk and slow progression of kidney disease and heart failure. There's more coming. I can't show you any of the data now, but there is a trial ongoing with GLP-1 RAs. And this trial is called FLOW. It's fully recruited. It'll be out next year. And the preliminary data from the post hoc analyses look very positive. And so this could be the fourth pillar in the quest to stop kidney disease progression. So I'm going to leave you with this pillars of therapy concept with the notion of an integrated approach, not drug A versus drug B and really putting together the physiology so that the patients can get maximal benefit. Thank you for your time, and I hope you've enjoyed this.